Alex Phillips and the ghost of her other half, Nicholas, who isn't here with me in the studio, but he has sent me something I've asked him to send me because he talks about this subject a lot and I want to talk about it on air because it connects to uh, the topic of conversation of Sir Keir Starmer's plans for pre-watershed ban on junk food advertising. And I've been saying, what is junk food, Mr Starmer? Because Russell Quirk and I were discussing the fact that if you go out and buy some vegan katsu curry, it's probably full of a load of horrible ultra-processed nonsense that's going to line your large gut with some oil slick, prevent gut bacteria growing and then lead to more and more instances of bowel cancer among young people. But the reason we don't have that conversation about the vegan ready meals being dangerous for you and just point the finger at McDonald's by and large is because big food are incredibly good at lobbying. They're also very good at coming up with a fad, infiltrating organisations and making you think this fad is good for you. And this has been going on a long time. Now, did you know that Procter & Gamble, who are the makers of Crisco, now that was an oil that was widely used in America and indeed sold, I think, on UK supermarket shelves as well. Um, it was made from cotton seed oil, right? Now this was left over, a byproduct of the cotton industry in America. So they thought, oh, well, what would we do to this rubbish that we don't use because it's not in people's, you know, uh, waistcoats? I know, let's sell it on to the big food industry. Well, Procter & Gamble paid the American Heart Association $1.7 million. In 1961, the American Heart Association then formally recommended that Americans stop using animal fats. They're bad for you, don't have animal fat. Instead, start using vegetable oils. And you have to ask yourself why. Not only that, if you look particularly at cottonseed oils, it's so bad for you um, that it generally has the power of being an insecticide. It's not like the palm oil debate of a few years ago. All of these things. Mm. Now, what you have, when you look at the big food industry and all of the rubbish they make, is they come up with a fad, oh, you've got to have low fats. Because that means you can't just go and buy a lump of cheese in the farm shop or a yoghurt made locally. No, you've got to have something that's been messed with to make it safer for you, except it doesn't. They lace these things with emulsifiers, stabilizers, the E numbers, the flavorings, the added sugars, they don't taste like rot. And people are ingesting a load of muck. And quite frankly, yeah, I think there's a big problem when people are having 25 McDonald's in a month or something like that. That's not good for you. But the same rules are not being applied to the vegan meals that are now being sold uh, under the guise of them being environmentally friendly and a healthy choice. Uh, let's talk to Dr. Lawrence Gerlis about this, who's a medical commentator and the GP at Same Day Doctor. Uh, Lawrence, it's great to have you on the programme. I've, yes, I've been fascinated by the lifestyle medicine thing for a very long time, and I came yeah. to the conclusion that the best way of going about things is just eating stuff that isn't in a packet. Now, <laughs> I would support, in many respects, Sir Keir Starmer, if he suddenly had the same moment of enlightenment and realises stuff in a packet in general isn't as good for you as the stuff that comes out of soil, I would support him if he comes up with a sense of policy structure around that. The problem I have with this is he wants to ban junk food adverts to save the NHS. Where have we heard that before? I'm not sure that banning the advertising of them is going to actually make people stop eating it. I, I would go down the route of we need a better education. But my concern here is that Big Food, with a number of its lobbyists and the way that they too, I gave the Potter and Gamble and American Heart Association example there. If you look at the people who sometimes uh, work in lockstep with uh, the British Heart Foundation, for instance, they tend to have a lot of industrial connections. I just have a feeling the government's not going to get this right. Yeah, well, first of all, let me say some of my vegan patients are the least healthy people that I see. They have vitamin and iron deficiencies, and generally their immune system is, is not as good as people that have a mixed and varied diet. You know, we are carnivores, although I do advise a generally low red meat diet, but, but I wouldn't cut it out completely. Look, I, I agree with you. I think that I've never bought into this ultra-processed food um, problem. I, I don't think it's an issue. I think that healthy food, fruit and vegetables, yes, low meat, um, chicken and fish are very healthy. But our main problem in this country is not just uh, what we eat, but the quantity. We eat too much. And I sometimes say to people, don't count the calories, just count how many meals you have in a day if you include the snacks. We also drink too much alcohol. And alcohol is a carbohydrate which puts on weight. It displaces fat from the liver. Um, and you're also right about lobbying. My work with diabetes for many years, I had to fight against the fact that 
we were always being lobbied about fats. Do you remember we were told one egg a week, to, a week is, is enough? Mm. Um, well, actually, eggs are incredibly healthy. And I had to persuade people, listen, fat is not the problem, sugar is the problem. Um, but there was a huge amount of lobbying against fats and switching to cis and trans fats or whatever. Um, look, I, I, doctors have done very well, actually, with bringing down cholesterol with statin treatment. And that's why we have an aging population. And that, to some extent, is part of the problem of health service. Whatever happens, uh, I don't think these changes are going to make any difference to health service short or long term, quite frankly. Uh, by the way, you made one of my, inadvertently made one of my favourite jokes in saying one egg is enough, because in French, one egg yeah. is enough. Uh, anyway, yeah. I like that joke. I'm, I'm slightly <laughs> bilingual, and it's one that I use all the time when I'm over in France. Um, but, you know, it's interesting. As a doctor, when you see people coming in through the door, and uh, and or on your screen or whatever, and it's quite clear they might have a, a form of metabolic syndrome because they've had poor diet, they've had they've made poor lifestyle choices, and then uh, you hear Sikir Starmer talking about needing an inter intervention to try and stop people getting to the point that they're going to be more reliant on the NHS because frankly we've got the powers within us as human beings to make decisions to be healthier adults. Um, yeah. Do you do you welcome that as a general rule? Listen, we, we eat unhealthy food because we like the taste, not because we've seen an advert on the TV. I had chips with my omelette last night um, because I like the taste. I'm, I'm generally pretty careful. I weigh myself most days. I keep my cholesterol and blood pressure down. I don't drink alcohol. I don't smoke. But I did have chips. And people are educated. Most people, school children are taught about the difference between healthy and unhealthy foods. People, by and large, know they don't actually need the education. They choose partly because unhealthy foods are cheaper, but mainly because the taste uh, is nicer for them. And I don't think a ban on advertising is going to change people's behaviour at uh, one iota. What does need to be done then? I mean, because otherwise more and more people are going to be coming to you and you're going to have to say, look, this is the dietary advice and they may follow it and they may not. If, they, if you're saying they're educated enough to know how to make choices, I think in part, yes, when it comes to bags of chips and... Um necking back a load of booze but i do think there's a funny gray area that people have stuff you know like like i bring up the vegan food fad for instance um, and have ultra processed food vegetarian sausages or whatnot they think are probably good for them when i would argue that they're not should the government be looking to regulate the food industry i don't think it's good government i don't believe in the nano state i've been accused of being a libertarian but i don't think the sugar tax has made any difference to anything i don't think the government should interfere i think it is a question of personal choice and most people make that choice. You ask what should be done, and, and I would focus very largely on alcohol. We do have an obesity problem in this country, and, and I think alcohol is a carbohydrate, and people forget that. They don't, they don't even think it counts when you add to food. Also stimulates the appetite, and the idea that you go out, have a few drinks, and then a kebab at midnight um, is, is part of the unhealthy lifestyle. Three meals a day, I mean, if we just start with that message, and reduce alcohol, that would bring down obesity levels. And uh, just before I let you go, I'm fascinated, uh, grimly fascinated, by the huge uptick in things like bowel cancers among yeah. young people. Uh, and, and the bits of research I'm reading that's starting to come out now is pointing the finger at things like emulsifiers, which are in so many food products, yeah. from sausages to mayonnaise. It's a very standard ingredient in yeah. uh, various foods that people buy, buy in the supermarket. Um, do you know anything about that? Uh, without a doubt, uh, there are certain foods that are associated with increased bowel cancer, red meat in particular, and processed red meats, um, so cured red meat, so bacon, ham, so on. Um, uh, there's no doubt about that. And I, I try to limit my red meat intake to, you know, one meal a week, but sometimes that's not, not easy. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And, and diet can affect bowel cancer, but a good high-fibre diet will also prevent bowel cancer. So fruit and vegetables, fantastic for you. And, I, you know, most people actually do know that, they choose to ignore it or they can't afford to follow those uh, that diet regime. 
I couldn't agree more. Dr. Lawrence Gurlis, thank you ever so much. Uh, Russell is interesting. So I think there's too many conventions when it comes to food that we blindly follow for no reason. So I'll give you an example. I really like broccoli. I love broccoli. I think broccoli is like manna from heaven. I don't know why. I just think it's delicious. And yet I don't find myself eating broccoli very much because, you know, I cook dinner in the evening. I might have some broccoli on the side, you know, this much. And the other day I had leftover broccoli, right? And I woke up in the morning and I was like, oh, what am I going to do with that? And I was rushing to come to work. So I thought, oh, I know, I'm just going to reheat it. It turned into a sludge, like school dinner level texture. And I thought, oh, I'll get you're a bit. Not, you're not selling it to no, us. No, wait, yet. wait. I, 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 so I put my so soggy broccoli, my very soft, squishy broccoli in a bowl, and I grated a bit of cheese on it and poached some eggs and popped that on top. And while I was spooning that into my mouth before coming to work, I was like, this is amazing. This actually tastes how really that taste good. It? That took no time at all because yeah, the broccoli, go. when I made my cup of tea in the morning, I just, yeah. I've done it this morning actually, make my cup of tea in the morning, go read the headlines, pan of broccoli on. Yeah, so, so And then I finish my cup of tea, go down, take my pan of broccoli off, put an egg in it and poach an egg in the water, three minutes, put that on top, and I now have broccoli for breakfast. Now, people might find that mad, but why? Why should no, but, that but, be but, mad? I think the whole point here is that, that, apart from the fact we've got a nanny state government telling us what to do, what we can and can't see, next will be what we can and can't eat, right? We see the slippery slope kind of opening up in front of us. It starts with the banning of adverts and then it becomes the banning of actual foods, you know, whether it be sugar or high tax, even more tax, which obviously will be attractive from this government because they love tax, right? And we're going to see that in, in the budget. The fact is, though, that actually I don't think people are particularly influenced by food adverts. I think what they are influenced by is uh, education to a degree, but also walking down supermarket aisles and just picking what they want. And I think, look, whether it's unhealthy or not, we have the absolute right as a nation to decide what we eat. Now, yes, we should be steered, cajoled, educated. We should be talking more about being fit and eating healthy stuff like you do. You have your poached egg broccoli concoction yeah, broccoli there. broccoli for breakfast. Um, I'm going to be again, an advocate for that. It's brilliant. It, it, and it comes then down to, you know, incentivising people. So, for instance, OK, it might take you an extra five minutes to cook your kids a fresh meal at night rather than just grabbing something from Tesco's that goes in the microwave. Mm. But what if it was substantially cheaper to do that? What, what if, let's say, shock horror, vegetables and fruit were perhaps subsidised or in some way mm. made cheaper and easier to buy yeah. than a bag of chips from the local chip shop four nights a week. Well, to be honest, I, think, I actually think vegetables probably are cheaper to buy. I think people for some oh, chips reason are, a are too lazy, course, too lazy to cook them. Chip, We're going to take a, a short break now, but I was just thinking actually, if you are what you eat and you became a vegan, would that make you Russell Quark? Or Brussels Quirk. Oh, oh. like. Uh. <laughs>